All right, and our next panelist is a, a guy I seem to get, I think, every year. I'm, I'm always moderating his panel for, for whatever reason. But uh, anyway, it's uh, Dr. Kevin Dyaratna. And uh, Kevin is a chief st statistician, data, uh, data scientist, and senior research fellow at the Heritage Foundation Center for Data Analysis, where he explores questions on the boundary of policy, statistics, and economics. An applied statistician, he has researched and published on the use of high-powered statistical models in public policy, medical outcomes, business, economics, and professional sports, among many other fields. He is a prolific scholar, having published numerous papers, both at Heritage as well as in the peer-reviewed literature in statistics, economics, law, and public policy journals. And his work has also been referenced by both the Obama and Trump administrations, numerous lawmakers and presidential candidates, and in front of the United States Supreme Court. So please, round of applause for Dr. Kevin Diorama. Thank you, that's slides, okay. Thank you, Tim. Thank you, uh, Jim Lakely, uh, James Taylor, and the Heartland Institute for putting this wonderful conference together. <laughs> My name is Kevin Dyeratna. I'm the Chief Statistician, Data Scientist, and Senior Research Fellow at the Heritage Foundation Center for Data, Data Analysis. And I'm gonna talk about unworkable climate solutions, carbon-based regulation. So what have we heard over the years? We've heard that the climate is changing. We've heard that carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases contribute significantly to this so-called problem. And we've heard that action must be taken. So we've heard a variety of so-called solutions over the years. We've heard about cap and trade decades ago, uh, the clean power plan during the Obama administration, the Paris Agreement, um, which pre uh, President Obama had entered the country into and President Biden recently re-entered the country into, the Green New Deal suggested by Bernie Sanders and Oc Alexander Ocasio-Cortez, a variety of state-level initiatives such as REGI, the California cap and trade, and so forth, and most recently, the whole ESG movement. Now, before we get into the main area of this talk, I'm going to first talk about what are these policies predicated on? And the answer is the so-called social cost of carbon. My colleague Ross McKittricks was alluding to this earlier today as well. The SCC, abbreviation for the social cost of carbon, is a class of models proposed as a basis for regulatory policy by the Obama administration. It is defined as the economic damages associated with a metric ton of carbon dioxide emissions, summed across a particular time horizon. And the Biden administration is currently in the process of resurrecting these models. So how does one actually estimate the SEC? The general question becomes, what is the economic impact of, of CO2 emissions summed across a particular time horizon. And there are three main statistical models used by the Obama administration for getting at this question, the DICE model, the FUN model, and the PAGE model. The, these models have since been tossed out by the Biden administration, and they're using three new models, the SCIM, GIVE, and the Howard and Cerner meta-analysis model. And this is a whole other topic in itself, but re the reason the, uh, the Biden administration threw the old models out is it's becoming quite apparent in initial reports they're publishing these new models enable them to jack up the SEC even higher. Now, as with any statistical model, these models are based on assumptions. So let's get into them a little bit. There are a variety of assumptions these models can make, including assumptions regarding agricultural productivity. This is an image from the paper Zoo et al. 2016 in the journal Nature. And the shaded areas of the planet represent trends in average observed leaf area index. And you can see the bottom line is between 1982 and 2009 that the planet has been greening, and the areas that are benefiting the most are the tropics, as you can see here. And I present this image because, like I said, agricultural productivity is a fundamentally important question because CO2 is an element of photosynthesis. It is fundamentally important to make sure you properly account for benefits in engaging in this cost-benefit analysis as it is when you account for the costs. And sadly, many of these models that the Obama administration used failed to do that. Here's another question that really drives a stake into the heart of these models. What are, what are the accuracy of these forecasts? This is uh, the global mid-tropospheric um, temperature forecasts. Um, presented by Dr. John Christie, who is a professor uh, uh, at the University of Alabama Huntsville. 
And the red curve are the average of 102 IPCC forecasts. The blue and green curves are actual weather balloon and satellite data. And you can see the gross over prediction. What Dr. Christie tried to do was use the models to backcast actual temperature data. And you can see the gross over prediction here. So you really start to wonder, how accurate are these models when they attempt to go centuries into the future when they can't even accurately forecast 20? At any rate, so a key question of the prior social cost of carbon research we looked at was, what does altering the assumptions made by the Obama, Obama administration do if you alter them in very reasonable ways? We ran two of the three models in-house at the Heritage Foundation Center for Data Analysis to do this. I'm not going to go into the research here. I've given many, many, many talks on this in the past, as well as written in the peer-reviewed literature, Heritage, as well as testified in front of Congress. But we noticed that the social cost of carbon under reasonable tweaks of these assumptions can drop by between 40 and 200 percent. They can even be negative at times under very reasonable assumptions. And the policy implication there is that one shouldn't be taxing CO2 emissions. They should be subsidizing it instead. And I don't take the position that you should be giving taxes or subsidies regarding CO2 emissions. But the bottom line is that the, if the models can illustrate either under very reasonable assumptions, that speaks volumes in terms of how prone they are to user manipulation, which is precisely what the government had been doing using them. And the Biden administration models are likely just as suspect. We're working on analyzing those as well. So the bottom line is, what exactly is the SEC? Well, no one knows, but nevertheless, they are used as the basis of policies such as carbon-based regulation. So like I said, one of President Biden's first initiatives when he became president was to re-enter the Paris Agreement. In terms of the actual goals, the goals was to reduce US greenhouse gas emissions by between 50 and 52%. Uh, by 2030 with respect to 2005 levels, the goal of fully decarbonizing the electricity center sector by 2035, and achieving economy net wide, uh, excuse me, economy wide net zero emissions by 2050. So how can we actually model the economic impact of this policy? Because if this is the policy that they want, let's actually score it. Let, let's see what happens when you score it. So at the Heritage Foundation Center for Data Analysis, another model we have is the Heritage Energy Model, which is a clone of the Department of Energy's National Energy Modeling System. This is a government model. Okay? This is not some model that we made in-house that the other side would like to accuse us of, of doing to cook the books. This is the government model, and it's essentially the Biden administration's own model because it is, again, coming from the Department of Energy. We use this model. We have to call it the Heritage Energy Model for legal reasons, though. We use this model to score the economic impact of a carbon tax that would enable us to achieve these levels of emissions reductions. So this is a challenging exercise, because any reasonable model is grounded in reality. That is, you have to have reasonable assumptions in a model, and everybody in this room realizes that net zero is not feasible. It's not feasible to get the 50 to 52% CO2 reductions by by 2030, and in fact, you plug that into this model, this model tells you the same thing. Namely, what we did was we took a carbon tax. Carbon taxes are the cleanest and crispest way to model these types of regulations because they actively discourage the use of CO2-intensive forms of energy. And we varied the level of the carbon tax to see how high we could push the model. Between $50 and $100, you achieve about a 37% reduction of CO2 emissions with respect to 2005 levels in 2030. Around $150, you achieve around a 41% reduction. And you ramp it up all the way to $300, you achieve a 44% reduction. Beyond that, this model crashes. That's what I'm telling you. The government's own model, the Biden administration's own model, can't handle their own energy policy. So we stopped at a 44% reduction to, um, and did the analysis based on that because that was the furthest we could push the model. So I will emphasize that the results I'm going to show you are actually vast underestimates of what the economic impact will be. Overall employment. Here we go. What we have done is, in terms of these simulations, when you institute such a carbon tax to discourage the most efficient and cheapest forms of energy, you are making the fundamental building block of society more expensive. Overall employment is now significantly reduced. The reason is the cost is higher. What you see is through 2040, an average employment shortfall of over 1.2 million lost jobs 
and a peak employment shortfall of over 7.8 million lost jobs. Family income plan plummets. Over the next 20 years, you see a significant reduction in family income. Namely, a family of four incurs an a, a total loss of income of over $87,000. Household electricity costs, they, not surprisingly, increase. 30% increase, um, 20 to 30% increase, I should say, household electricity increases in expenditures um, through 2040. So the bottom line, instituting the associated carbon capture regulations by 2040. You have an average employment shortfall of over 1.2 million lost jobs. A loss of income of over $87,000 for a family of four. Up to 30% up to increase in household electricity expenditures. And an aggregate $7 trillion loss in GDP. Now, nevertheless, there are people out there that will say, OK, we need to incur some economic pain to, get to save the planet. So OK, so what is the climate impact of this policy? We should score that as well. Well, at the Heritage Foundation Center for Data Analysis, we have yet another model that answers this question. And this is also a government model, the model for the assessment of greenhouse gas-induced climate change. I heard um, an allusion to this this morning. This is magic with two Cs. We assume commonly accepted projections by the IPCC regarding CO2 emissions trajectories going forward. And we vary climate sensitivity, that is, how sensitive is the planet to CO2 emissions, in the 1.5 to 4.5 degree band that the IPCC has recommended. So these are assumptions that the IPCC themselves believes are legitimate. So the question that we want to pursue here is, what would happen if the United States were to actually fulfill the Biden administration's goals and eliminate fossil fuels? In fact, what if we just actually gave them the benefit of the doubt and suppose we could set them to zero starting tomorrow? Here you go. So we have a variety of pairs of curves here. Each pair of curve, is, each pair of curves, I should say, is under a different assumption of climate sensitivity. So the one that I think is the most informative is the four and a half degree sensitivity because even alarmists will say that is too high. The gray curve is the current trajectory that we are on, assuming a four and a half degree sensitivity, the top curve. The blue curve is right below is the trajectory that we are on, assuming that we were to eliminate fossil CO2 emissions from fossil fuels completely. And you can see that even under an overly sensitive climate, you have less than 0.2 degrees Celsius temperature mitigation. And on top of this, you would see about two centimeters of sea level rise reduction. How about the state of Florida, the Sunshine State right here? I ran this as well. By 2050, you will have less than 0.043 degrees Celsius mitigation if this state decided to eliminate fossil fuels from its state completely, and 0.0088 degrees Celsius temperature mitigation by 2100. In terms of sea level rise, my old colleague Chip Knappenberger, who used to be the Cato Institute, did this. He has a nice paper on this. By 2050, 0.0262 centimeters of sea level rise reduction. And by 2100, 0.0786 centimeters of sea level rise reduction. So measly, to say the least. So the bottom line is carbon-based regulation is an unworkable climate solution. It's not even a solution because, firstly, nobody in here believes that we are headed toward a catastrophe. But when you actually try to score this, giving the other side the benefit of the doubt, you will notice that all that results is significant economic costs and negligible environmental impact. So the advice for policymakers we have here, avoid carbon taxes and carbon capture related policies. All they will do is shrink the economy and have no meaningful impact on the climate. Secondly, stop using the social cost of carbon for cost benefit analysis. As I have shown, it can, be, it can be manipulated to get any result you want, which is precisely what the Obama administration had been doing. And I'll bet you this is what the Biden administration is going to do when they issue their formal estimates in the coming months. And we urge lawmakers to employ cost-benefit analysis that was done here. It is fundamentally important to score the economic side as well as the climate impact, and not in terms of CO2 emissions, in terms of actual temperatures themselves. Lawmakers like to hide behind the fact that they think that they can score just, they can tell what the CO2 emissions are, but they don't go the step further and say, OK, what would be the impact on the temperature? What would be the impact on sea level rise? Thank you. Happy to take any questions.